of an all the team there. And then they won, England won, Great Britain won gold medal. First time ever won a gold medal. And I was in the press office just after that. And they were going, who, who's this Charlotte? <laughs> is she French? You know, Dujan, where did she come from? And a lot's happened since then. That was only, what, 14 months ago. It must be a whirlwind you're living in, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's been a fairy tale for me. I mean, obviously, um, 2011 was my first year Grand Prix. Um, and I won uh, first year European gold medal and um, I had the most amazing year. And didn't think, obviously, it could get better. I then was got to, uh, I wanted to get to London 2012. That was my real dream. Uh, just something I set myself as a young child. I just wanted to get to London 2012. Um, and uh, coming out and winning two gold medals was just, I mean, I, I look back now at what I've done and it's so surreal uh, to think I've got two gold medals, I've broken world records, I've done everything. I, I set myself four things and um, I've achieved more than those four things. And, and for me, that's crazy. It's, it's, you know, if someone had sat down and said, this is what you're going to do, I would have laughed and said, never. I, you know, you just don't think it's possible what I've achieved in 18 months. I've, I've, I'd like to just refer to your childhood and to your equestrian life up until when you took up dressage. Tell us about it, because you know, you haven't been doing dressage from the age of six, have you? No, I, I um, started off doing um, showing, so um, I did it from like lead drain all the way up to um, horses. Um, and I was very successful. Um, I won Horse of the Year show and hit Royal International, which is Hickstead. And, you know, we travelled every weekend and we did it, but I was always trained by a dressage trainer. And she's always saying to me, she's like, why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing dressage? And, um, it wasn't until she put me on her Grand Prix horse and she just wanted to see if I had what I was capable of doing really and um, she just stood in the arena, put me on her Grand Prix horse and screamed at me to do this sort of, these movements which I had no idea what I was meant to be doing but I just had a go and she just was amazed with what I did and um, it was going from that I then bought a, a DVD of Carl Hester and I watched it a demonstration that he actually did and uh, he was teaching a horse Piaf and Passage so I had an Irish thoroughbred at the time and um, I thought oh that would be great fun I'll go take my horse and teach him that and um, I did and I then went to um, a birds training day and um, my mum went up to him and went she can do Piaf and Passage and I was like mum what are you doing don't tell him that I didn't even know if it was right so uh, I did it and they were absolutely amazed then, of course, you stole the ride off Carl, didn't you? <laughs> so, joining Carl was obviously a massive step on the, on the way to your success. And I know that you're, you're very, very grateful to everything that happened at the yard. But you didn't actually go there full time to start with. How did that pan out? Uh, I, uh, it was quite funny. I, I did, um, I had three lessons. On the fourth lesson, he said, oh, my head girl's going away for 10 days. Would you like to, um, Cover. So I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was amazing. And within the 10 days, I was riding his Grand Prix horses, doing all sorts of things. And I was like, God, I rang my mum every day. I was just absolutely amazed with what I was doing. And um, I never went home. I, I literally, I stayed from, from those 10 days. And um, I, I've been there ever since. I want to come on and talk to Roy shortly because the whole headgear thing has become synonymous with your success but let's get the update on Vallegro you, you've become as a pair the two of you as you know champions in Great Britain are we going to see you on Vallegro in the future uh, hopefully we're just at the moment trying to uh, get syndicate together so we can keep him for me to ride um, we have got a couple of people interested so uh, fingers crossed we'll be able to do it Alistair was saying earlier, you, you referred to exactly this situation, okay. you know, we've got to keep these horses. Peter Charles wins gold uh, on the Merkel horse, and it's now owned by Bruce Springsteen yeah. in the United States of America. You know, Ben and Nick are riding regularly in Florida, owners are there. You know, we've just got to try and find a way 
whether it's the generosity of wealthy people, or the tax system, or whatever, I don't know. You know, big impartiality, Claxton sounding. But, you know, she is a genius, the horse is a genius, they are a British pair of geniuses, and we should do everything within our powers to keep that together. But she's got to make a living as well. That's the balance that's got to be achieved, and it's, it's a tough call. Charlotte, I referred to Charles Owen earlier. That you, it goes, it's synonymous with dressage to wear a top hat. And you broke that mould. And Charles Owen was very much a, a, a partner in, in, in your riding over the last year. Tell us about the, perhaps Roy, you could tell us. Roy Burick has managed to direct Charles Owen's a family owned company, and Roy's third generation. So again, a British company. It's fabulous to be where they are. Yeah. Roy, how did it work? How did it start, your association with Charlotte? Well, I mean, following uh, the high-profile death, uh, no, the death, sorry, uh, injury <laughs> of um, an Olympic rider in the US, the whole m feeling that riding dressage horses was totally safe. There's absolutely nothing that can happen to you because they don't spook, they don't do anything, they're very, very calm. Um, well, that myth was, was broken. And so there was a move amongst many of the associations of, well, what do we do? We, we obviously have this whole rite of passage of the top hat, but how do we actually move forward and develop something? She's talking about you. Um, <laughs> she just said you were talking with her. Okay, right okay. <laughs> So the, the British Dressage wanted to, to actually develop something and we're looking around to the industry to see what, what, was, what were we going to do. Were we going to develop the huge top hat um, that people would uh, you know, think was really cool in the tradition or do we develop something else? And the other key thing was that Dressage was really trying to shape this this image of you white dressage if you're too afraid to jump. And so a lot of the top athletes were seen as not necessarily athletes, but can performers. And they feel that people like Charlotte are as fit and, and capable as any other top athlete. And so there was this whole feeling of, is it time that we actually move the, the, the outfit on to really represent that athletic field. For me, and I think it's important, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the, one of the most fabulous parts of the story about Charlotte riding that hat is that, that it would be very, it would be natural for people to presume that Charlotte is sponsored by Charles Owens so she's told she has to wear it. But I understand that when it comes to international competitions, you're not under any contractual arrangement to wear it. That's important. Tell us, Charlotte. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not... I was quite... Um, well, with Roy, I, I said, I, you know, obviously, when the top hat... Obviously, everyone wants to ride in top hat. And when I started riding my crash hat, everyone was like, oh, my God, what are you doing? It looks so wrong. You can't wear your top, your crash hat with your tail coat. And <clears throat> I actually had a fall myself. I fell off. I fractured my skull. Um, and then as and from that day, I was like, I'm not ever riding without my crash hat. And um, for me now, it's like an insecurity. If I don't have my crash hat on, it feels wrong. Uh, not even with my top hat on. I, don't, I just don't feel safe with my top hat on. And um, so, so for me to do that, but at the Olympics, it was great because uh, before it all started, the press were desperate to find out what hat I was wearing, whether it was going to be my top hat or my crash hat, and I, I, I wouldn't let them know. I, I was uh, very strict as to keep it a surprise. I might add, you didn't really <laughs> not let the press know. I didn't think you let anyone know, did no, you? No, no, I, no one this knew. Most, Roy was telling me yesterday about the story at Greenwich, and, and, and so was Daniel Santos from America with Charles Owen, that they were standing there literally a few minutes before Charlotte went into the arena in Greenwich. They still didn't know whether Charlotte was going to take a hat off and put a top hat on. And I think that's awesome. I think it's yeah. lovely that they didn't know. Yeah. I think it's a really, really great. But obviously, and it, and it is important, you're not doing, doing it wearing the Charles Owen hat because you're contractually obliged. You do it because you like it. 
I also happened to notice an interview is about two hours after you got out of the arena at Greenwich, you were still wearing the Charles yeah. hat. So I take it it's comfortable. Yeah, no, I love I love my hat. I mean, I, I really, really do. I don't even know I have it on. And um, I know everyone was saying, God, you must have been paid a fortune to wear that hat. Because obviously I never took it off. But I mean, I, I just literally, I always have it on. I just, it, it's not something, you know, it's not one of those hats where I put on and I desperately want to take off as soon as I get out. It, you know, I, I just feel comfortable and it, it makes me feel safe and so, uh, you know, I'm really happy to wear it.